Kia ora and welcome to our third remote sensing webinar this week. Brent is talking to us today and he's a senior data scientist in the informatics team at Manaki Whenua. He works on a wide range of image processing approaches to help us better understand how our environment is changing. Today he's talking about how these techniques can be applied to pest management. I'll be back for questions and answers at the end of Brent's talk, but over to you now, Brent. Thank you, Christine, and hello, everyone. Um, what I'm going to be talking about this morning is a couple of examples of where we are using um, the AI technique of deep learning to uh, help us in the war against pests. I'm going to be looking at two very, very different domains. Um, the first one is around uh, being able to detect predator pests from camera trail imagery. And the second is looking at mapping the um, infestation of wild and conifers in New Zealand. So first of all, for those of you who are newbies to deep learning, deep learning is a type of machine learning um, that has come along in the last decade or two and has been particularly successful in the area of computer vision, which is what we're interested in. So computer vision has been using machine learning for a long time now, and typically the way people used to do things was they got their set of images that they were going to analyze, and a human had to come up with a pipeline for extracting features from those images that they thought would be, would be predictive um, for a model. They would then use machine learning techniques to um, map those features into a classification that says what is in the image. About um, 10 or so years ago, deep learning came along and revolutionized the whole space because what it did is it did away with that bit that the human has to do. So deep learning typically is referring to um, called deep artificial neural networks, and they can automatically work out what are the important features in the image and then do the classification. And the result of that was um, back in 2010 in a popular competition, the typical winning error rate was around 28%. And then deep learning came along, the very first version, and dropped that error down to 5%. So suddenly computer vision became extremely uh, good, uh, extremely good and extremely accurate. So we've been using deep learning at Manaki Whenua for computer vision for a number of years now. And uh, we've used a number of different approaches for different domains. For example, we can do image classification to do things like detecting what is the species of beach pollen in my microscope slide. Uh, object detection to pick up things like animals and imagery, semantic segmentation for automated mapping of things like land cover and land use. And maybe sometime in the not too distant future, we'll be able to apply these techniques to um, devices and, and then we can have automated devices doing our war against pests for us. So let's start with detecting predators. These days, if you want to monitor for predators such as possums, it's pretty straightforward to do. You can buy yourself a um, trail camera or camera trap quite cheaply, put it up in the field, leave it there for weeks or months, and get tens if not hundreds of thousands of images back. That's the good bit. The bad bit is um, chances are that many of those images, if not the majority of them, will be false tree rings and there's nothing to see. Of those that there is something to see, you might only be interested in one or two of the species, um, and you, so you've got to go through, sort those images out, and work out which ones have what you want. So the question is, can we use this deep learning computer vision to automate that task? Well, the promise is quite good. Um, artificial intelligence and deep learning in particular has been used to do this for quite a while now. And there are data sets out there, such as the Serengeti data set containing animals from the Serengeti, and there are object detection algorithms such as YOLO that can do this to accuracies of around 95%. So they can tell you what are, where are the animals in the image and what are they. Uh, more recently, there's a, a system called Camera Trap Detector that you can download and use that does the same thing. And this was trained on uh, images from the North American Camera Trap Image data set, again, to high accuracy. That's the good bit. The not so good bit is the fact that when you look at these images, they're a bit of a dream for an AI approach because the animals are large, the images are very clear, and if you, as a human, if you're trying to work out what's in the images, you can do it quite easily. And generally what we say in computer vision is, if a human can do it easily, then these days the AI should be able to do it as well. Anyone who's had to deal with trial camera imagery, unfortunately, will, will be aware that it's not the case for this imagery. 
and you can have all sorts of problems uh, from the one in the top left there where the possum being photographed is too close to the camera because it's currently trying to tear it to pieces. Uh, you also get things like um, overexposure that means you can't see the animal. Uh, we've got animals doing interesting things like wallabies having a scrap. Um, and so basically the imagery is so diverse that the accuracy typically is much, much lower, say around 70 to 75 percent. And that's just not enough uh, accuracy for us to be able to rely on it. The problem is that with all of these um, approaches like deep learning, we need to be able to train the, uh, the deep learning network to do what we want to do. And that requires a lot of training data. So the easiest way to do that is to do image classification where the network is simply trying to say, I think there's a bird in this image. But the problem with that is um, we can get the data relatively easily, but because the bird is only a small part of the image, there's a, a reasonable chance that the network is going to pick up something else in the image and erroneously think that that's what is causing it to uh, this particular image to be a bird on the left hand side. So for example, the deep learning network may focus on that bit of foliage in the red box and say anything with that in it is a bird, which is obviously wrong. And similarly on the right, um, images of kiwis in their nests, the images we have um, are almost always overexposed in the foreground and it's quite easy for the uh, model to erroneously learn that seeing all that brightness in the imagery means it's an image of a kiwi, which is not very helpful. To get around that problem, people generally today use object detection techniques. So now the idea is that um, the network is going to work out, is there an animal, where is it, and then what is it? And we train that on images where we've annotated where the animal actually is so that it can ignore the rest of the image. The problem with that is it's extremely time consuming to do that, um, to generate all that training data. So what we've done is a pretty common approach now, which is to use a two-stage pipeline. So we take all of our training images, which have been sorted into different species, and instead of us happening to say where the animals are, we pass them into an off-the-shelf detector called Mega Detector V5, which has been developed by Microsoft and uh, other researchers. Mega Detector V5 knows nothing about New Zealand animals in particular, but it's really good at figuring out where is any animal in the image and, um, and telling you where it is. So we use that to detect the animals in our imagery, and then we can crop the images down to just the animal and use that to train our own classifier, which is going to classify the animal according to its species. So by doing that, we were able to very, very quickly apply um, this approach to 250,000 images that we'd collected, which is enough to um, train that classification model to do a pretty accurate job. So now when we want to, um, fire, uh, want to process new imagery, we do exactly the same thing. We pass the images in, we pass them to Mega Detector, which uh, figures out if there's an animal in there or not, and if so, does that cropping, then passes that to our classification network, and the classification network is able to come back and tell us what the species is. And it also, in, bo in both the case of Mega Detector and the classifier, they also tell us how confident the model is um, that it's got the answer right. So the performance of this pipeline is pretty good. Um, for those who haven't seen one before, what you're looking at here is called a confusion matrix. And it's basically showing us in the green boxes the number of images that were correct, uh, correctly um, detected and classified. And the yellow ones are the numbers showing us where things were incorrectly classified and what the incorrect classification was. So just for example, in this cell that I'm pointing at, um, there were 102 hedgehog images out of, the, out of over a thousand that were incorrectly thought to be empty when in fact they contained a hedgehog. But overall, uh, for this um, example of 15,000 images, our model got it 84% um, accurate, which is a big improvement on that 70 to 75% um, previously. Um, also on this particular set of images, the model correctly detected and removed 93% of the false triggering, so that dramatically reduces the amount of work we have to do looking at the remaining images. And typically when people are doing processing of camera trap images, they don't just look at the individual images, they look at a minimum at um, a burst of images that have been taken of the same animal, and commonly we'll, they'll also group images together um, for sort of a period during which the camera is active and assume that that's all the same animal. So if you do that, you now get a whole lot of images that you classify, take a vote on that, and that gets you towards 100% accuracy at um, detecting what the species are in your imagery. 
So we're now working on uh, taking that original research uh, model and turning it into a tool. So what we're building is the ability for you in the future to take all your images, pass them into a system, and have them automatically sorted into folders according to the species. If you're testing, so if you already know what the species are, you've already sorted your images, you can run them through and test it, and the, um, our tools will output that confusion matrix so you can see how well it's doing. And finally, on the bottom right, you get a spreadsheet which gives you all the information that the model has produced. And this is really useful for things like, um, although our model can detect 15 different species, maybe I'm only looking for feral cats. So what I can do is I can take that spreadsheet and I can sort it uh, on the, the confidence levels just for cats. And that way I might look down the confidences from the most to least confident. And I might have an image in there, for example, where the model thought it was something else, but it said, well, there's still a 30% probability it's a cat. And so I might want to go look at that image to make sure I capture every single example. So right now, um, this is being built into a system called CamTrap NZ, which will be an open access tool for everyone to use. There is a beta version of this model already integrated into the TrapNZ website. So if you're a user of that, you can now upload images and, and try out the model and see how it does on them. We also have built a, a kind of very prototype standalone uh, Windows PC application, which is being tested by a number of different organizations at the moment, but that allows you on your own PC to um, process large numbers of images. And there's further enhancements coming to this, including most importantly, the ability of the system to continuously train so that it is improving the more it is used. And also um, the ability to be able to take a kind of two pass approach where you give it a few of your images that you've already manually told, uh, classified them as to what they are, and you can use that to fine tune the tool so that when you give it the rest of your images, you'll get more accurate results. And finally, looking further ahead, in the future, um, we would like to integrate the tool into other tools so that you can use it as part of, of your current processing pipeline. So that's our first domain, that's, that's looking at um, the pest detection. And now to something completely different, looking at national wilding infestation monitoring. So the question here is, can we use deep learning uh, computer vision to automatically map all of the um, wilding infestations, wilding conifers in New Zealand, and ideally to a high resolution, um, where not only it shows us where the wildings are, but gives us an estimation of their density, that it picks up change over time, and we're interested in what's the cost versus sensitivity here? So can we use free satellite imagery and get a good enough result? Or what happens if we go to aerial imagery, which is much more high resolution, but is gonna cost money to collect? So in our first attempt at this, we looked at whether deep learning could pick up relatively high density uh, wild and conifer infestations. Again, in theory, um, looking at it from a human point of view, it looks like it should be doable. So what we've got in the image here is a time sequence of um, an area of New Zealand looking at Sentinel-2 uh, 10 meter resolution 10 band imagery. And we're looking at a couple of the bands that pick up um, exotic trees very well. So in these um, yellow outline blobs here, these are areas that are known to contain wildings, which in the final image here, they've been controlled. And so we can see how the red, which is the conifers, is uh, increasing in density over time until in the second to last image, it's very dense, and then it all gets controlled. And as a human, I can easily see that most, if not all of those, uh, those red trees have disappeared. And the question is, can the computer do the same thing? So we use a different deep learning approach for this, something that's called semantic segmentation. And the idea here is that we take the imagery, and then we take um, a GIS layer, which is a map of the thing we're interested in, and we feed those into our um, network, which is called an encoder-decoder network. And what it learns to do is to transform the image into the map. And so once we've done this, we can take another image, pass it into our trained model. And in this case, what we get out is a map that looks a bit like this picture on the right, where the brightness of the white is the, um, hopefully, the density of um, exotics or conifers in the image. And so that gives us an automated map of um, those conifers. Once again, the problem with training a network to do something like that is um, you need a lot of training data. And we did have some exotic um, 
uh, some information about wilding infestations that we got from MPI, but it was nowhere near enough to be able to train the model. So what we've done instead, we've taken a bit of a kind of sideways cheat approach. Um, we have used uh, MPI's, um, sorry, MFE's Lucas land use map, because that map contains uh, accurate mapping of all the exotic plantations in New Zealand, the vast majority of which, of course, is Pinus radiata, so that's examples of conifers. It also contains some mapping of wildings, but it's less accurate and is known to be nowhere near complete. The good news, though, is because it's nationwide coverage, it's a massive amount of training data, so we can train a very robust model. And the question is, if we give it training data that contains roughly the thing we're looking for, but doesn't actually contain all the wilding areas that we want to map, will the model nonetheless detect those wilding areas? To evaluate it, we did get some uh, accurately mapped uh, information from MPI. So these are areas that have um, been known to be infestations, uh, and in most cases, these are dense areas that have been controlled already. So first of all, does that approach work for detecting wildings? And the answer, thankfully, is yes. So if we look at the image on the left here, we've got an RGB rendering of a satellite image, and layered over the top of that is um, the information from the LUM map. So all of these green areas are known conifer uh, or exotic um, uh, forestry areas. And the blue polygons are um, known wilding areas from that map. But what we can see here, we can see easily with our own eye, there's a whole lot of trees in here that the LUM map doesn't know about. So in other words, our training data didn't contain this. The, the training data in fact said this area is not um, exotic. But when we train the model on the whole of New Zealand, those sorts of areas are sufficiently small that when we come back and run the model over the same image, it quite faithfully picks up all of that extra exotic area. So this says, yes, it can pick up exotics um, that were not in the original training data, and when we look around at those areas um, that we know about from the MPI mapping, we find that indeed it does pick up the wild and conifer infestations. The next question is, if it can pick up the, those um, infestations, can it also detect when the infestations have been controlled? And so what we have here is um, some example control polygons from the Castle Hill area in, here in the South Island. Um, so these green polygons here are all uh, accurately mapped areas, and if we look inside them, again, we're looking at sentinel imagery, and these sort of um, deep red colour areas are, are wildings. On the, in the image on the right, this is after they've been controlled, and so if we look in those polygons again, we see that most of that red has gone. When we look at what our model has produced, it has accurately picked all that up. So here we can see within those wilding areas, we can see all the wilding conifers. We also see some extra areas. Um, the one I'm pointing to at the moment is, in fact, another wilding area, but it wasn't part of the MPI program. And up the top, we have a plantation forest. On the right, once the control has occurred and we run our model over that image, we see that all of our wildings pretty much have disappeared from those areas. That extra area has been mostly controlled, which is what we can see in the image above, and our plantation is still there. We can then take uh, the output of this of the model, so this map, these uh, map rasters, and we can aggregate the um, pixel values for each of the polygons, giving us an average probability value. And what we see is um, the classic pattern here is that the infestations are getting stronger up until the point that they get controlled, and then they fall off a cliff because we just killed all the trees off. Um, and so that pattern shows us that um, the model is indeed picking up um, the change in density there when they're getting controlled. So the last bit of the puzzle is we want to be able to estimate the density of the wildings. And um, briefly, if we look at this qualitatively, um, we've got images here, uh, pre and post control, and what the model shows, and the model's output of their average um, uh, probability from the map. And they look like they pretty uh, are a pretty good representation of the density of the conifers in the images, both before and after. So that's, that's qualitatively. We then looked at it quantitatively by actually going in and doing manual density estimations on about 60 of these polygons. And we were then able to um, chart uh, or plot the um, estimations that we did manually with what came out of the model in terms of its probability. And what we find is actually that probability is a pretty good proxy for the density of the wildings. So we have all the pieces in place now 
um, to hopefully be able to um, make a, that map of the wild in density. And the last thing is just looking at the sentinel imagery, we found that it can nicely pick up those dense uh, wildings, which is the blue line here. We can see that pattern of growth and then death. Um, we also found that for uh, moderate density areas, which are much lower density, we're talking around 2% coverage rather than um, average of over 20%. Indeed, the model also picks those up, which is a good result. Uh, we also had some areas that, um, that MPI mapped for us that were very sparse, well below 1% coverage. The model does kind of pick those up, um, but it's, um, the values are so small that it's likely that it would get lost in background noise. So the last piece of the puzzle is to ask the question, if we were to introduce aerial imagery at much higher resolution, as well as the Sentinel uh, 10 meter 10 band imagery into our um, pipeline, can we get uh, also those sparse infestations being picked up and the density being modelled? So that's um, our attempts at mapping uh, wilding infestation to date. So, so far it's looking very promising. Um, still quite a bit of work to do yet before we have a national map. And that in a nutshell is a couple of examples of how we're using deep learning at Manaki Whenua in the war against pests. Thank you, and I'll hand back to Christine. Thanks Brent, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Hey, I've got a really basic question just to start with. What's the difference between deep learning and AI, or machine learning and, and AI? Right, uh, and this is probably quite topical at the moment because the, the, these things all get interchanged, um, used interchangeably. So I'll start with machine learning, um, which is by far the most common type of AI being used today. So machine learning, broadly speaking, is the idea that you have some sort of um, algorithm that you can train uh, based on past examples of something being done so that, they, um, so that that algorithm is now able to do that task for you in the future. So we've just seen examples. Everything I've showed you today is machine learning. Um, so for example, when we put in imagery, where we, where we also tell it what the species is and the model learns to do that in the future. So broadly speaking, that's machine learning. Deep learning is a subset of that. It's a specific approach um, using something called a deep artificial neural network that can learn very deep layers of concepts. And so it's very, very powerful at how it can do that machine learning. But it's just a subset of machine learning. There are lots of other ways of doing that too. AI, which is the one you hear most commonly, is the one that is very hard to define. Um, so very generally speaking, artificial intelligence is trying to get a computer to do something that you believe requires human-like intelligence to be able to do that. And that's a definition that changes all the time. So um, if, if you go not very long ago, things like speech recognition would, would have been called artificial intelligence. Now that we can do that really well, we just call it speech recognition and we don't even think about it. So artificial intelligence is the superset of, of machine learning. But most of the time today, when people say artificial intelligence, they actually are actually using machine learning, and more often than not, they're actually using deep learning. Um, and this even includes things like ChatGPT, which lots of people will have heard about, um, the large language models that, that can generate text. Under the hood, there is a deep learning network that's doing the work there. Great, thank you, thanks. Um, and I've got one quick question about images, and we're then going to talk, ask you about video. But um, I've noticed that all the images of pests look like they're taken at night. Why is that? Um, so the examples that I've shown you are taken at night, but people do take imagery in the daytime as well. However, um, particularly for a lot of the um, predators we're interested in, they are typically active at night, they're nocturnal. Um, some of them, in, uh, such as possums, you'd be very lucky to see a possum in the daytime unless it's dead. Um, and so most of the imagery that you'll see will be nighttime imagery. So logical. Um, now we've got a couple of questions here about um, identification from video. Um, ben was saying that uh, they are often looking for identification from a 30 second video rather than uh, the JPEG. Yep. Have we done some work around that? We uh, specifically haven't done that yet. I have done work uh, in that area with the cacophony group that some people will have heard of. Um, so video is on the list for us to do uh, shortly as well. And there's sort of a, there's a couple of things involved here. Um, so one of them is 
you can simply take video and strip all of the images out of it and classify all of those and you'll get a pretty good result because you'll have 30 images a second um, to take a vote on. Um, but you can also, there are, there are various different techniques where you can actually use the motion in the video to get further clues about what it is because there are certain animals um, that even if in the image you can't particularly see what they are, the way they move is extremely indicative of what they are. Right, so Paul was asking also about, and this, this probably relates I think, have we tried deep learning approaches for the detection of animal behaviours in lab situations from video? That would be what you're talking about there? Uh, so I think what, you, what Paul is talking about is um, potentially rather than just uh, using it to detect species, which they probably already know because <laughs> it's in the lab, um, what they're interested in is um, can you can, can the machine automatically um, essentially classify the behaviour of the animal? And I know there's interest in that within Manaki Whenua. We haven't applied deep learning to that yet, um, but that is being studied. So people are particularly interested in things like, could you, for example, detect that an animal approaching was being cautious or that the animal is quite bold? If you had an automated trap, for example, you might want it to behave differently in those two different scenarios to lure the animal in. Great, fantastic. It's good to know there's some of the stuff um, yet to come. Um, here's an interesting one. How does the um, deep learning system deal with large quantities of a single species, like a mob of pigs, for instance? Yeah, so um, the deep learning would certainly be able to do that. The, the What I showed you in terms of that species detection is more focused on the idea of individual images. But um, that object detection, which is the, the front end of, of uh, the software we're using there, that will, um, if you set it up appropriately, that will detect multiple instances. So just as you saw the image of the zebras that showed you the multiple zebras, and even though they overlapped, um, that uh, that algorithm YOLO, which is actually what's sitting underneath our work, uh, was able to to accurately pick up you know the whole animals even though they were in front of each other. Um, a similar thing can apply to mobs of animals, and it's been used by people like Canterbury University for things like counting penguins in Antarctica um, and other things like that. Great. We're going to finish off with a couple of questions on the wild and conifer um, work as well. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a time frame for um, delivering a wilding conifer national map? Um, well, this is very much a research pro project at the moment. So um, it's, it's a project being done for MPI. Um, the timeline of that project right now is um, to we will deliver what we will deliver by the end of this financial year. So we'll, we'll, we'll come up with, with um, a first example. Um, but it's fair to say that this is still research in process at the moment. Great, and I think that that relates perhaps to this question um, from Paul. Um, he's pointed out that Lucas has a minimum size of plantation that it's mapped, so it doesn't capture all the woodlots. How do you differentiate between wildings and you know maybe smaller planted woodlots? Yeah, that's that's actually a really good question. Um, at this stage, I don't have an answer to that, except to acknowledge that we know that that's a problem. And it's not only um, that to do with the size of mapping in those woodlots, um, it's also to do with uh, other um, examples of exotics that get picked up that are not mapped at all because they're not considered interesting. Um, for example, in um, Mount Barker down here in the South Island, there's an enormous shelter belt, which is, um, exotic and that may or may not be in the lum because they may not be interested in it. Great, thanks. Look, we've got some more questions um, and we will come back to all of those who've asked questions with responses and we will post them on our website alongside the um, video from today and Brent's presentation. This is the third in a series of five uh, remote sensing webinars and tomorrow Ben Jolly will discuss some quite related work in the detection of beech tree flowering which is known to result in, a, in an explosion of pests. Uh, if you haven't already registered for that check the link in the email following this session and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Many thanks. Thank you all.